Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast, Episode 141. Wireless LAN Professionals is a place to educate, inform, encourage, and entertain those involved in wireless LANs. This Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast is an audio manifestation of these goals. Our host is a wireless LAN veteran, consultant, designer, and teacher, Keith Parsons. And now, the podcast for wireless LAN professionals by wireless LAN professionals. Today I'm with uh, Tom Carpenter of CWMP, and uh, we're going to have a little discussion about some of the tools you can use to do troubleshooting in support of Wi-Fi that perhaps aren't in a, you know, standard, you know, go out and buy a, a tool. So how are you today, Tom? Doing good. How about yourself? Great. Glad we had a chance to to catch up, and we're, this is kind of a pre-WLPC uh, recording, but it's probably going to go out post. Um, you're, you're teaching a CWNA 107 boot camp. Is that correct? That's correct. Looking forward to it too. So what are the, just a, uh, you know, a 30 second recap, what are the new things that are in 107 that were, weren't in the previous version for this CWNA? Uh, the big things are that the new CWNA, of course, has been completely revamped, reordered, restructured. So uh, everything is more in a good flow now, rather than having a chapter, for example, that talks about 11N and 11AC. It's just discussed when we talk about physical layers. So um, everything has been aggregated together into a more solid flow. And of course, there is more coverage of 802.11ac. There's some coverage of 11AD, uh, AHAF, things like that, but more just mention of those, not excessive details. But uh, definitely better coverage of the newer technologies. And of course, we've trimmed it down a little bit in some areas where it needed to be in the security area, the design area, the analysis area. So that stuff's moving into the exciting new things coming this year with CWAP and CWDP and so on. Uh, coming up, we have a DP and an AP a job task analysis. Can you explain what what a JT? I can't even pronounce it. Job task analysis is. Yeah. So you know the concept of a job task analysis in the certification industry is a little different than you know, if you just go out on the internet and do a search for job task analysis, you're going to see all kinds of human resources stuff where it's focused on knowing a job. Uh, for for the purpose of hiring someone. Well, we take that back a little bit of a step because uh, a job in the real world often consists of many roles. We have to do the job task analysis for a very specific role that we're targeting. So if it's CWAP, then it's the role of a wireless network professional as an analyzer, someone who has to analyze network problems, things like that. So um, our job task analysis may not cover every single thing that a wireless person would do in their real world job, but everything they would do in the specific job role that the certification is focused on. So that's the first thing. But the big goal is to say, what does someone in that role do? And when we understand what they do, then we can determine the knowledge that's required to do that. And therefore, build our testing objectives, our learning materials, and everything from that. So we're actually spending an entire week at the end of March doing half of the week for CWDP and half of the week for CWAP. We've got seven subject matter experts that will be participating in each of those. So uh, 14 total bodies, not necessarily 14 total separate humans. Uh, For example, Peter McKenzie, one human, but he'll be there for both of them. (laughs) And uh, at least I think he's just one human. I'm not sure about that, but uh, he will be there. And so we're really excited, looking forward to it. It sounds like it sounds like I'm one. I just applaud the effort. I think it's a great thing. Uh, It really, really helps hone down in, in, and every, you know, Every decade or so, it's probably good to come back and find out what does someone really do in this job. And then obviously we can end up testing for that specific role. So good good stuff coming down, uh, both from WOPC, teaching the CBNA and the new thing, and job task analysis, which means sometime later this year, we should be looking for a new CWNA, sorry, CWAP and a new CWDP exam. Is that correct? Absolutely. And not only the JTA, Keith, we've got uh, the right people involved ongoing after the JTA. So several people are going to be involved in objectives analysis and creation, and then also in the development of our courses and exams and everything. So we're just excited that we've got the right crew together participating and ready to go. And it's a really big project. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of steps to go from just the JTA all the way to having an exam and learning uh, tools to help you get there. So kudos to you and your team for pulling it off. Well done. 
Thank you. Well, let's let's talk a little bit about um, maybe maybe we could put them in the in the category of free, as in things you have just with your standard OS that you could use to help troubleshoot wife. Yeah. Uh, standard OS normally has uh, you know your client connection to Wi-Fi, and sometimes there's some pieces of information you can use there. And just about every OS uh, has some form of CLI where you can get to a command line and have it run some things. So in it, previous, and we'll put the link to this in the show notes, uh, you did a um, little video. Uh, I don't know what you call your, your little training videos on uh, using net tools, uh, commands on a Windows platform, and you had a your own um, personal blog that had a little script that does that. So I thought maybe we could talk a little bit about those kind of tools and and how you came up with that and what's, you know, how, how people can use those to help troubleshoot their own Wi-Fi networks. Yeah, absolutely. And so, you know, one of the big pain points in Windows, for example, with wireless has always been that we seem to be lacking in the GUI interface any real insight into even an existing wireless connection, the bars are just useless. And that's pretty much all we had. Um, it, and so a lot of people said, well, what am I supposed to do? Well, there's kind of a back door. You can go into the network GUI interface and you can do a troubleshooting analysis against the wireless connection. And it will give you all kinds of really exceptional statistics, signal strength of different uh, BSSs in DBM and things like that. So you can get that, but it's a hidden little back door. You've got to go through hoops and hurdles to get to it. And so the command line interface um, or the command prompt, as it's been called since the Windows 95 days in uh, Windows, gives you some insights into some of that. And it's built into this little tool called the network shell. So the network shell or the net sh command, that's all one word, net sh, uh, has many sub commands. It's not just about wireless. You can configure your IP settings. You can configure your Ethernet adapter. You can configure network services and work with them and so forth. But there's an entire subsection of NetSH that is the WLAN subsection. So if you just go to a command prompt and type NetSH and hit enter, it's going to take you into the network shell. Then you type WLAN and hit enter, and it takes you into the wireless LAN subsection of that shell, wherein you have just a ton of different commands. And uh, for example, one that a lot of people know about is the uh, show networks command. So if you either are in NetSH in the shell in WLAN mode and you type show networks, it will show you them. Or if you just from a raw command prompt type all of it, NetSH space WLAN space show space networks, you can do it that way too. And it will show you the networks. Um, and what that does then is if you're not connected, it scans and then gives you back the results of the networks that have been discovered. Now, I'm being a little unfair there because it doesn't really truly scan at that moment. And a lot of people don't know that. But Windows is already scanning in the background and it's just dumping to you the most recent list from the most recent scan. That's why when you type it, it instantly dumps it all. And you might think, well, how in the world did it scan 2.4 and 5 gigahertz channels that fast? The secret is it didn't. Um, sometime in the recent past, a few hundred milliseconds ago, it already did a scan. And it's simply showing you the results of that very quickly. So a little kind of secret there as to how that works so quick. Do you, do you happen to know what the default scan time is? So is it, you know, every every five seconds is going to do that behind the scenes or is it constantly going on? You know, that's an interesting question. And I tried to dive into that a while back. Um, there's a, a program you can download free from Microsoft called the Microsoft Message Analyzer. Another tool a lot of people don't know about, but it's, I, I don't want to say it's a protocol analyzer because it's so much more. It's a Windows trace analyzer, which includes protocol analysis as well. And um, if you run that and start a trace and you've got a wireless adapter, it's going to show you every time there's a scan event. And so I thought, hey, I can use this and I can figure out how frequently those scans take place. And what I found interesting, Keith, was that on different systems with different wireless interfaces, it would actually scan at different intervals. It, wa it wasn't as consistent as I expected it to be, almost like the device driver was driving it somehow. So I'm not really sure. I've, I did contact a person at Microsoft and literally never heard back from them. So I'm not really sure if it is the 
Windows wireless stack or the device driver itself that makes that decision because I did see variance in how frequently it was. But one of them, just as an example that I tested, was a D-Link 802.11ac USB adapter. And it was literally doing the scan twice every second. So every 500 milliseconds, it was relaunching a scan. How long does it take? I mean, that that usually takes quite a bit. I mean, even if it's only dwelling for a tenth of a second per channel, long enough to hear a beacon, there's more channel. It's like three or four seconds worth of time to, to do that. Well, and what I did find too was that it'll scan 2.4 gigahertz. Then the next time it'll scan 5 gigahertz. And that's why if you ever look when you... Uh, bring up your network list in a Windows system. As soon as you first connect your wireless adapter, if you're using USB, all your 2.4 gigahertz stuff shows up. And you might expect a low 5 gigahertz channel to show up really quickly. But what you find is that there seems to be this extra delay before any 5 gigahertz channels start showing up. And that seems to be because one of the habits is to do a scan only of 2.4 gigahertz and then to do a scan only of a section of five gigahertz and then the next section and so forth. This is another reason why I'm go I go back to saying I'm not sure that that's the Windows stack that's making that decision, that it's just receiving it from the driver when the driver makes it available. But you will see that kind of thing, that when you're looking at the message analyzer traces um, and you see the scan results of the networks that it discovered, one of them may only be listing 2.4 gigahertz channels that it found. So I think that probably answers the question as to how it's getting through it, but taking a little bit longer to do it. So NetAce SH space WLAN space uh, show space network? Correct. And um, by the way, if, if you're old Cisco hat and you're used to iOS and you know that you can type just enough of the command as long as it's unique, NetSH works exactly the same way. So the tabs the same the tabs as well. Well, it, let me back that up. <laughs> it does tab, but it, it's weird. It, it, I have found now on Windows 10, and I can't remember if this was the way it was before, but on Windows 10, when you hit tab, it puts spaces where the characters would be for the rest of the command, but it doesn't type the rest of the command. And then it lets you keep going. So I don't know, call it a bug in NetSH or what, but tab completion sort of kind of works, not necessarily like you would expect. Um, but yeah, so the actual command is uh, NetSH WLAN show networks with an S, but if you just type network, it still works. That's the beauty of it. Or if you just type net were, it will work as well. Um, so once you learn the minimum you have to type, it can really save you a lot of keystrokes. <laughs> well, what are, what are some of the things you can find? Well, one, of, one of the things I find very uh, useful is on a Mac OS, uh, one of Adrian's tools allows you to see visually what the current MCS is and how often it changes, which kind of shocks people when they see it. They're like, wait, it's changing. Wait, it just changed again. Uh, is, there a, is there a tool that you can, or a command that you can run there to see what the current MCS value is uh, on your client? You can see the data rate. Uh, NetSH doesn't show the MCS value. Um, and in fact, I don't know of a Windows client um, driver that does or software tool that does at the CLI. Um, now we could figure it out because we can look at the uh, NetSH WLAN show drivers command, get information about drivers. We can use the um, show wireless capabilities command, get information about that, and then do a networks mode equals BSSID. So instead of just show networks, we add the mode equals BSSID and that'll show us the data rate. So if you know the capabilities of your adapter and you know the data rate, you can put them together to come up with the MCS, but boy, that's awful hard. So, you know, I would say go back to using GUI tools um, like Acrylic Wi-Fi Pro in Windows, if you're using Windows, or something like that to get that information because uh, it's just going to be too complicated with NetSH. It, yeah, it gets you close, but uh, not, not quite as easy as we like. Well, what are some of the other things you can see about your uh, wireless network using these command tools? Uh, one of the things that's really nice is NetSH, uh, well, Windows itself has this thing called trace logs. And you can use NetSH to enable trace logs for the wireless LAN uh, subsystem. And so uh, NetSH WLAN set tracing mode equals yes, turns it on. And when you've monitored, maybe you try to connect to a network and you can't, you want to see why you weren't able to connect or something like that. When you're done with all of your tests, you just run the same command, only you set the mode to no instead of yes. And 
uh, that what that'll do, you'll see there'll be this very lengthy pause. It's generating HTML reports. So when you're done and you've set the mode to no and it's doing that work, after it's all finished, there'll be two files. Depending on your system, they'll either be in Windows slash tracing slash wireless, or they'll just be in the root of your hard drive. It varies by Windows system. But the two files are wireless.cab and wireless.etl. The ETL file is a trace file, and the CAB file, if, if you know Microsoft's been using CAB files since before Windows 95, actually. A lot of people don't know that. They first really noticed it with Windows 95, but they've been using it since the early 90s, and it's really just a compressed file storage container is all it is. If you double-click on the CAB file, it'll open it up, and then you can actually double-click on report.html, and you have an amazing amount of diagnostics information in that report. It'll literally tell you you tried to connect to an SSID and you failed and give you at least hints as to why you failed. And then as far as the ETL file, you can open that up with Microsoft Message Analyzer, the free GUI tool that you can download. And you can actually look at every little trace event that occurred while you were doing your testing. That's one of my favorite lesser known capabilities of both NetSH and the Message Analyzer together. On a Windows platform, you can get a lot of deep insights into what's going on in wireless. Is this all uh, is wonderful stuff? Because one, you need to know how your client's reacting. But can you use these same tools to evaluate as, say, my, it's my test tool and I want to watch another client to see how they're doing? Does it have that kind of promiscuous mode capability? It does not. So it's a, a local analysis only. Um, now, if that other machine is a Windows client, you know, you could have in an enterprise environment, you could have batch files that you've created and put in your pre-deployment images for all of your laptops and so forth. And then you could just basically have that batch file scheduled to run at a periodic time or set so that you can get into it from remote to launch it. Um, assuming they're on some kind of a network connection or just instruct the user how to launch it. Um, so you could have a batch file that'll do it for you. And then, of course, get those cab file, the ETL file over for analysis. But sadly, there's no real remote monitoring capabilities and there's no real capturing of Wi-Fi frames off of the air with Microsoft Message Analyzer either. It's only your local analysis. Uh, so yeah. <laughs> on, on that note, if we wanted to run Wireshark, and Wireshark runs uh, native on Windows OS, not a problem, how can we, what's the best way that you found for bringing in wireless captures into Wireshark on Windows? Oh, you don't even want to know my answer for the best way. Um, <laughs> well, my answer is really simple. You just buy a Mac and then you're solved. Exactly. You've got two options, um, buy a Mac or uh, use a virtual machine that you run Linux in and then run Wireshark in that virtual machine with a USB wireless adapter supported by Linux to do the capture. And the good news is we actually do have a couple of 802.11 AC adapters now that are supported for capture in Linux. So you know, we could do that. So that's really your only choice. If you really want to do it, that's it. Because the old, uh, uh, what were they called, Air PCAP adapters, you know, that they haven't kept up, right? So we don't really have the latest and greatest with that. Yeah, that's, I mean, there, there's some things that we have complaints about iOS. You can't, you know, scan and use like a Wi-Fi analyzer on your iPhone, which is, you know, sad that we can't do that. On the flip side, you can't Wireshark directly into into Windows either. Exactly. All you're yeah. going to get your IP stuff. That's it. It's, it's like they don't listen to us at all. What's, what's up with that? Well, and they promised us, uh, well, I say us. I had a conversation with an individual at Microsoft uh, several months ago, and they have said that they're going to be opening the wireless stack and they're going to be allowing that to happen. When is that? Windows 20? I don't know. So at this point, we're still in the dark. Okay. So is there, other than NetSH and the following group of the WLAN commands that go with that, uh, any other thing you use when you're troubleshooting wireless just with the native machine? Um, well, of course, in, uh, if we flip over from Windows to the Linux environment, your uh, command line interface is going to have uh, your typical IW commands. So IW Phi. Uh, gives you information about your adapter, drivers, capabilities of the device, things like that. Very powerful command to know about in Linux. And of course, IWconfig for just looking at your wireless configuration. What are you connected to? Um, what is your signal strength? And of course, being able to connect with IWconfig. So those are your, your typical Linux command line interface commands that you use that are built in. And of course, the difference with Linux and Windows is, uh, you know, depending on your distribution, you're going to use 
um, whatever your application installer is. You know, I use a lot of Ubuntu based stuff. And so for me, it's the uh, apt command and you can get just about anything you want or need for free uh, as far as analysis goes in the CLI. So we've got tons of tools when it comes to the Linux environment. And of course, that means those tools are at least in some ways available to you in both Mac and Windows, because you can always run Linux in a virtual machine on either of those platforms. And if you're using a USB adapter, you can get wireless pass through. It will not take you, you know, your internal Mac adapter necessarily and make it a true wireless adapter in the virtual machine. But with USB, you can do that. By, by definition, it's virtualized and it's no longer a, a I mean, it, looks, it just shows up as another Ethernet. Exactly. But external external necks are available and they work. Uh, and another problem for us who want to do more wireless analysis. And part of the reason I think why uh, Ekaha came out with Sidekick was, you know, there's not a, a financial advantage for any NIC manufacturer to make a high-end Wi-Fi NIC when every single machine you might plug it into already has its own Wi-Fi. So I, I understand why we don't have great Wi-Fi tools. Just, just it's not not as fun as we'd like. Exactly. Uh, Mac OS, any hints there? Yeah, on the Mac OS, of course, as I'm sure you know, and most people that use the the Mac's platform a lot, the the airport command is the big one in that world, right? So, um, and Apple's done some interesting things with it over the years and yeah, made it to where you had to create symbolic links at one point and different things. But uh, there, there's information all over the net about how to get it to work again if it's not just immediately available to you. But the airport command is kind of like the NetSH command uh, on the Mac OS, only it is going to give you uh, some of the more detailed specifications about your connection that NetSH is lacking. I use it uh, quite frequently, and and with some weird little batch files, you can even make it uh, talk to you while you're surveying, and it will go out and you know do the scan, find the ones, and then say out loud, oh, this is your current RSSI as you walk along. Uh, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, so, <laughs> so what did you do on the scripting side with the net sh command? I remember you did some stuff on your on your your personal website. Yeah, I did a couple things. Uh, there's a little batch file at tomcarpenter.net that um, basically just runs through with net sh and gathers and aggregate aggregates a bunch of useful information um, so that you get a nice little report. So there's that script, and then the other one I. I wanted a little more capability. I wanted something that gave me in the GUI interface some of the stuff that NetSH makes available. And I was just always so frustrated that I always had to go to a command prompt to get it. And I couldn't just have a GUI that maybe I just left sitting there running for some period of time. And so I threw together uh, a little utility that runs on Windows. It is a GUI interface. And all it really is in the back end is a shell out to NetSH. So it's using NetSH to gather the data and then it's displaying that data to you. And you can just set the iteration for the number of times you want it to run. So a very simple tool, not at all a commercial viable product. There is no support, <laughs> it, but it gets the job done. So it's a simple tool that lets you just quickly uh, see the status of your connection, the signal strength of the connection and so forth. And so it can be useful if you're you know, walking around in an area and you wanna just see what NetSH is saying. The only bad side is it's uh, percentage based. It's a, a typical bad Microsoft move there to make it so that it's just saying, you know, your signal is 70%. Well, what in the world does that mean? And so there are algorithms you can do to uh, calculate what that means relatively close to DBM, but it's uh, certainly not as accurate as we'd like. I always called that when Air Magnet had a little button that tripped between DB and percentage. I call it the manager button because managers yeah, yeah. definitely understand percentage. And DBMs just kind of mess with their heads because they're all backwards and upside down. And Fair point. Yeah. So Microsoft just jumped ahead and just let managers see that. I guess. We'll give them that credit. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks for your time. We had a chance to talk a little about, about some of the net commands that are available on all major OSs have the ability to, to help troubleshoot some of your uh, wireless issues. Uh, some have a little more detail than others. But if you're running Windows or Linux or Mac, you uh, owe it to yourself to try out some of those commands. Uh, Tom, can you just tell us where we might find some of your uh, materials online? And we'll we'll add the actual URLs to the show notes. Sure. You can uh, go to tomcarpenter.net. That's where you can find the little scripts that I've given away that are out there for you to download. 
And of course, uh, we've talked in the past about some of these tools at uh, YouTube on our CWNP TV YouTube channel. So you can definitely get information from both of those sources. And uh, just lastly, you've now started a new uh, kind of a CWNP news. Uh, what's that little extra thing? And we'll give you a plug for that. I appreciate that. Yeah. So we launched at the beginning of this year, first Friday of the year, the Wireless Land News Desk. And the primary focus is just to call the news of the week and get a couple of things out of there that are both useful to know and an opportunity to maybe learn something. Um, so just as an example here, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about the 802.11 AX wireless AP announcement from Arrowhive. And my focus was not on, oh, is it draft or what? Although we talked a little bit about that. My focus was on 802.3 BZ. And so I said, hey, they announced this device. It supports it. Let's talk about what that is and why that matters. So it's just an opportunity for us to take from the news good little learning nuggets for the community. Well, thanks for the time and effort to do that and and bring those bring those to light. Um, good luck with uh, your your new role. Just have the CWS, CWT are now uh, live. That's correct. They are live and we actually have our first three certified CWTs. Oh man, maybe I should. I didn't even think about taking that. That's, that's, <laughs> two, that's two new certs I can get. Oh, right. <laughs> well, thanks for your time and uh, good luck. We'll see you at uh, WOPC and uh, teaching your boot camp there. Thank you. Excellent. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Back to basics. Okay, I'm Spiel Velipekka here. So this time I will talk about LTEU, not only LTEU, but as well LAA and all the aspects that uh, unlicensed LTE brings here and how it impacts Wi-Fi environments. I have some quite detailed information here, so I hope you can uh, kind of bear with me there uh, while I walk through this. I hope this will be useful. Of course, it's a controversial topic, and there are different opinions. So I will present some facts, and uh, hopefully that will help you to make your own conclusions. Here is some data from Cable Labs. They made a measurement where they put LTE transmitter on, they duty cycled that, and then they measured Wi-Fi throughput. And they come up with the result that when the LTE U, LTE transmitter is 50% of the time on with 50% duty cycle, Wi-Fi throughput is degraded by 70%. So, so that's the without any precautions or kind of coexistent technologies. This is how the LTE and Wi-Fi coexist. They really don't coexist very well. I think that's well known. So Wi-Fi seems to be losing. Here is another statement from Qualcomm. LTE is a better neighbor than Wi-Fi is for Wi-Fi itself. So quite an opposite statement. In their testing, they found that, that LTE as a neighbor actually gives Wi-Fi better throughput. So quite an opposite statement for, compared to the pre previous uh, test results from Cable Labs. So, so there are obviously different statements based on different type of test scenarios. And it makes making the conclusions and trying to stay on the facts, it makes that hard. So Peter Thornycroft already covered this partly, but what's the purpose of this unlicensed? So the purpose is to give more bandwidth for mobile operators, mobile networks, by using an anchor carrier in the licensed band, so LTE carrier in the LTE frequencies, and then using another carrier in the unlicensed band which may use LTE modulation, or it might use Wi-Fi. And then pair these two and get more data through and get more capacity. So this is, of course, the, the goal. And it's a goal of 5G to somehow bring these together. But in fact, this functionality is already key functionality in a gigabit LTE networks, which is 4.5G and not 5G. 
And Gigabit LTE networks are already being deployed or have been already deployed in a number of locations. So these technologies are already in use. There are different type of technologies, kind of different categories of technologies which operate in this space. One category of technologies guarantees fair coexistence because the bonded channel uses Wi-Fi. So these technologies are uh, LWIP and LWA. So Wi-Fi carrier is used in parallel with LTE carrier and they coexist nicely obviously because the Wi-Fi is Wi-Fi and it works nicely together with other Wi-Fi. So LWIP is not very widely used. It basically uses a tunnel uh, over the Wi-Fi, but the drawback of that technology is that it actually alternates the path. So I'll send this packet over the LTE, this packet over the Wi-Fi, so it doesn't provide the gains that you really want to achieve. It's a software change only, so that's the one of the beauty of that alternative. The other one is more attractive, LWA. So there you aggregate LTE carrier in LTE frequencies and Wi-Fi carrier in five gigahertz frequency band and you get more throughput, more capacity. It uses those in parallel as well it has evolution when Y gig comes more common it can use the Y gig 60 gigahertz a bandwidth, which is very large. And as well, it offers uplink. Typically, these alternatives are downlink oriented, but, but uh, this EW, e, uh, LWA as well uses uh, uplink. So traffic is split, so you get the double capacity. For some reason, this alternative, is it currently gaining a lot of attention or traction? But these are the fair coexistent guaranteed alternatives. Then here are the more commonly referred alternatives for unlicensed. So LTEU. LTEU was the, the early standard. It was a way to, it's not a 3GPP standard. 3GP standard is seen to take time, so industry wanted to move faster and they came up with LTEU. And LTEU uses LTE modulation in five gigahertz band. So they will need to then share the five gigahertz band with Wi-Fi. So LTEU does not do listen before talk. It uses different, uh, different uh, technology there. I'll get into that in more detail a little bit later uses a technology called CSAT, which is basically duty cycling the LTE carrier based on some sampling of uh, the, how much there is traffic in the band. So LTEU is used and allowed to be used only in certain countries, US, China, uh, South Korea, for example, where listen before talk is not required. So it's a dual bearer, so you get all the benefits of the bandwidth. So this, so this is the controversial alternative. So, and it's, it's maybe not the, the direction the world is going right now. It was the early technology, which was deployed fast. It's being used, but I think the evolution is moving towards the LAA. And LAA is the one which is being wide, widely used. So LAA, on the other hand, again, five gigahertz, in the five gigahertz band, there is a LTE carrier. It uses listen before talk, but it's not Wi-Fi listen before talk. And it's only based on energy detect, minus 62 dBm threshold, typically. So initially, it's downlink only, but as well, uh, the ELAA will have uplink as well. So it's a dual bearer, you get the full benefits. And goal of LEE, LAA has been that it doesn't impact more Wi-Fi than Wi-Fi would impact. 
itself otherwise why in the same area so this is the direction where the world is going mostly as of today then there is another variant of this technology it's called multifier and this is a standalone so so this is like wi-fi enterprise it doesn't require any any carriers or any bearers in the license spectrum it's operating completely in the unlicensed space. It uses a lot of same technologies as LAA, but, uh, but it's uh, completely in the unlicensed space. So Multifier is co directly competing with Wi-Fi. Very similar use cases. It's not a 3GPP standard again, but it's, uh, it's, it's developed by Multifier Alliance. And there are products out, are coming out uh, which support this. So, so these are the different categories. Wi-Fi protocol being used at Wi-Fi band, LTE protocol being used at Wi-Fi band, but using as well the LTE anchor, and then the standalone multifier completely in unlicensed using LTE protocol with some coexistent technologies. Bands and power levels are very important here. So Unlicensed is likely to use the unit 3 band initially. It allows how high, higher power levels, so up to 1 watt power levels. As well likely to use the unit 1, which doesn't require DFS. It seems that the DFS bands are not the priority right now for unlicensed, so they will start from unit 3 and unit 1 mostly. I'm not going to go through this much, but this is the Wi-Fi, you know, how the CSMA works. So there is the listen before talk, and you have to do the energy detect, and you have to do the preamble detect. Minus 62 for energy detect, minus 82 for preamble detect for, for a 20 megahertz channel bandwidth. And then there's the back off and so on. You know this stuff. So, so how about then the LTE? So LTE is 100% scheduled. It does not listen before talk. It's a schedule, space tensor schedules frames. For uplink, it schedules transmission opportunities, basically slots. There are your uplink slots when you can transmit and then the clients transmit. So it's completely scheduled. There's no sensing before sending. It includes OFDMA like AX standard will as well include OFDMA. It includes um, resource blocks, time slots, full frame is 10 milliseconds, subframes are 1 millisecond, and one time slot is half a subframe. It uses hybrid ARQ, which means that retries can be combined. So you have a retry, you have another retry, you can combine them you get benefits from that, so it's different. Different channel bandwidths, 1.4, 3, 5, 10, 15, and 20. And then you can aggregate those as well together. These are different, obviously. So one way to see this is that Wi-Fi is like a private car. You can leave when you like. There's no waiting time. You get going. You need to follow the traffic signs. There are, you know, the beacons and so on, so you need to follow the traffic signs. You might hit traffic. You might get delayed. There are other travelers as well. So it's very flexible to deploy. You don't need necessarily frames or, or roads. You still will reach your destination. On the other hand, uh, LTE is like a train. You need tracks, you need uh, frames. It runs always, even without any passengers, it will always run. Frames will be there waiting for passengers. Passengers come in, they go into the frame or to the train, and then they get transported. So it has a schedule. You need to you know, be at the station when the train leaves, otherwise you will miss the train. So it requires the tracks, so you need to have those. You cannot have anything else in the tracks, otherwise there will be a collision problems. It's efficient for high volumes. 
Now, let's look at what happens when you put a car on a tracks. And you may expect it doesn't end well. Let's see what happens. So here is an example where, where Wi-Fi and LTE were kind of uh, put on the same channel. LTE is using five megahertz channel bandwidth. You can see that in the spectrum there. And Wi-Fi is using 20 megahertz channel bandwidth. LTE has, a, in this case, a little bit higher power level. And you can see that later in the graphs as well. It's easier to see the difference between LTE and Wi-Fi transmissions. So this is using G only. They use G in this paper with SDRs, 2.4, just to investigate the protocol behavior. In this example, you can see LTE only, downlink control signal transmissions. So this is 10 milliseconds, a frame. You can see up here, the time slots. So you can see these are uplink time slots. So clients could send here. Uh, these are downlink time slots with some control signals. So the power comes up, but there's no traffic, it goes down. But there is the frame structure. Uh, so uplink is empty. There is also some signaling time slots. You can see some traffic there. So power is here down during the uplink opportunities and then downlink, you can see power up during the signaling. So this is LTE only. Now this is what happens when you combine LTE signaling only with Wi-Fi traffic. So you can see the LTE signaling here, you know, the higher power levels, the control signals. Wi-Fi finds some opportunities here, for example, during the uplink time slots when there is nothing to transmit. So Wi-Fi is transmitting here. And then as well here, uh, during the downlink time slots when the LTE is actually not sending any data. So that's how it looks. LTE control only, Wi-Fi sending data. Now what happens when LTE starts sending data? So it looks like this. So basically LTE takes over completely. So, so this is LTE uplink, this is LTE downlink, there is no downtime in between, it's fully scheduled used. During the signal in time slot, Wi-Fi finds a small slot to send something, and then that's, that's about it. So in this case, if there is no coexistent mechanisms, then basically Wi-Fi will get disconnected. It doesn't receive anything, so it's disconnected. It doesn't detect the beacons or anything. It would get disconnected. Here, here are some measurement results from this paper. So Wi-Fi only without LTE interference, 28 megabit per second. Then here, LTE control signals alone. And the power levels now play a role here. So what is the, what is the power level? Is it above this energy detect level or is it below that? That's critical. So when power level is below the energy detect level, LTE does not fall back, or, or sorry, Wi-Fi Wi doesn't fall back. So, so throughput is uh, higher, but when the power level is higher, Wi-Fi will fall back to the energy detect uh, procedure. And this is with the traffic, so, so when there is data, and when the LTE signal level is above the energy detect level, then, then the throughput will be very low. So to address this, there are some coexistent uh, uh, built into the standards. So LTEU coexistent includes a couple of key topics. So channel selection. When the LTE base station goes to a certain channel, it will select an empty channel. And it will use that. When it will use that, it's full duty cycle. If there, is, if there are no open channels, it will go to the least used channel, and it will sample the channel occupancy uh, with ED method, measuring the power levels there, with sampling periods from 10 milliseconds to 200 milliseconds. And then it will schedule duty cycle for the next couple of 100 milliseconds based on this sampling. So, it will do the cycle LTE up, LTE down, LTE up, LTE down, and do, do the transmissions. But it doesn't do listen before talk, really. 
In addition, LTE, you will uh, use opportunistic secondary channel, meaning that if there just isn't any space, it might not decide to use the supplementary downlink at all. It might turn it off. So it will try to avoid, but it doesn't do listen before talk. It's just duty cycles to transmission at the same time when there's other Wi-Fi traffic. Full duty cycle when no Wi-Fi traffic, and if there's Wi-Fi traffic, no empty channels available, it will duty cycle. LTEAA, LAA, on the other hand, uh, it has this goal that it should not impact more other Wi-Fi networks than any other Wi-Fi network would. So LTLAA has two main principles for coexistence. So one of them is frame-based equipment. Another one is called load-based equipment. Frame-based equipment uses random back of fixed contention windows and load-based equipment use random back of an adaptive contention windows. Load-based equipment is more similar to Wi-Fi than frame-based equipment. So, so I think this uh, picture better describes the principle here. So frame-based equipment, so if the CCA fails, and this is ED-based only, important to remember, it's only mandatory to have the ED based only. So CCA fails, it will stay out of the channel for a fixed period. It will try again. If it's a successful channel available, it will occupy the channel for a fixed time period. And then it will again do CCA fails, it will not occupy the channel. So this, this is a fixed period, but then there is the CCA process. But load-based equipment is smarter than that. So if if the CCA fails, it sets a counter. In this case, it sets it two. So there needs to be two times when it finds empty space there before it can transmit. And then it will transmit the frame. It will do CCA again. If successful, it can continue transmitting. And duration of this transmission is as well a variable. So it's not always fixed. Again here, it sets a random CCA, if it fails, it needs to stay back for four successful times of doing CCA. So uh, these are all unsuccessful. These are four successful CCA. So you can again transmit the frame. So it's more like Wi Fi. So Wi Fi Alliance put a lot of work in there to create a test plan to ensure that unlicensed and licensed can coexist in 5 gigahertz band. It was completed in September 2016. So they have a detailed test plan, which you can view. It's available. It has a number of tests, which test channel selection, you know, connection availability, LTU adapting to the changing conditions in the network, as well impact to the latency, packet loss, throughput, jitter, with different power levels, including as well you know, low power levels below the ED threshold. So, so that's, a, that's a great test plan. I have not seen any reports yet really published showing compliance that we are compliant with this test plan. No vendor, to my knowledge, has uh, published such reports or even claimed that they are compliant with the test plan. Test plan is there. Okay. Then some products. So. This, these technologies are actually already out there. So they are being used. So here is some information. So LTEU and LWA trials and plans. So LTEU is used in, uh, by a number of operators in USA, China, uh, South Korea, especially, as well as Russia. So trials and deployments. So this is the controversial alternative, this LTEU. Duty cycling only. No listen before talk. Then LWA. This is the kind of uh, alternative. It sounds great that Wi-Fi protocol only in five gigs, and then LTE protocol in the license bands. But it's it has not yet so far taken off really well. So some uh, trials. LTEU as well really became a stepping stone before LAA. So LAA has much more deployments. It's deployed in a number of locations in US, 
and as well elsewhere, and seems to be the way to go. So unlicensed uh, chipsets, so Qualcomm has been active here, and for example, Snapdragon 835 supports LAA and LTEU both. So depending what is available from the network, it will adapt to that. And it's used, for example, in Samsung Galaxy S8, very popular phone. It's hard to tell when the devices are using this because to my knowledge, it's not indicated. Okay, some product examples here. So SpiderClight Wireless is one provider. Uh, they have as well, you know, there's an access point and they have actually this kind of clip-on module in addition to uh, uh, separate base station. Ericsson has here an example of product. Nokia announced multifier product, which will be available this year. Output power levels up to one watt. So that will be indoors. It will be competing with Wi-Fi from airtime. Okay, Wi-Fi design consideration. What does, it, what does this mean? It seems that the key theme real here really is how the channel is sensed with LAA. So it's energy detect only what is mandatory. Some vendors are implementing some additional capabilities. They might actually put a Wi-Fi radio in to do a better job coordinating the traffic. But here is a comparison for receive side. So, so this kind of illustration is always good to see the kind of coverage difference. Obviously, this is open space, 6TP doubles the radius. So energy detect is 62 here, and carrier sense is minus 82 here. So you know, there is a large area beyond the 62. And LTEU does minus 62 only as mandatory. It might do, some products might actually do something else, but this is mandatory. Of course, LTE, LTE and the analysis doesn't detect either Wi-Fi traffic, so it will be impacted by Wi-Fi traffic to some extent, but usually it doesn't care, so Wi-Fi will step out. Power levels then, Wi-Fi, typical power levels, 14 dBm, 20 dBm, and when you co kind of compare that to maximum power levels with unlicensed, it can transmit up to one watt. So there is a significant difference in the coverage area. So this is an important factor to consider. Wi-Fi consideration, design consideration. So likely to use Uni3, Uni1, initially non-DFS. In practice, of course, retries will increase. It's hard to tell how retries, uh, sorry, the rate control changes or behaves. If there is suddenly some traffic and then it's gone, and then the retry tries to kind of shift down because it didn't go through, and then next moment the uh, interference is gone, so it could use higher rates, but, but there is some slowness in the rate, retry, uh, rate control process. Different vendors, it will be different way they deal with these environments. It's hard to tell when you are using LAA, for example. What is the impact to the performance? So you really need to pay attention to this going forward because there will be more and more deployments. And you need to kind of stay top on, on top of the performance aspects of, of your Wi-Fi. Okay, finally, key takeaways. So, so it's uh, coming to the five, five, five gigahertz band. It's already there. At the minimum, it always adds more traffic to the band which will reduce Wi-Fi wi -Fi capacity. Overall capacity is not hit as much as the Wi-Fi capacity, but it does have a negative impact on Wi-Fi performance. And uh, it doesn't do sensing the channel. It uses only ED, and uh, the 3GPP ED doesn't alone guarantee safe coexistence or fair coexistence. It can be made they can be made coexist well, but it all depends how those parameters are chosen. What is the actual ED threshold which is being used? Wi-Fi Alliance came up with a test plan, but there is no need to, there's no need for type approvals, there's no need to publish the results, there's no need to be compliant with this test plan. And we have not seen any reports yet, at least I haven't seen any reports how fairly different vendors coexist. So 
This analysis is a very important topic going forward. You need to pay attention to that. You may have five gigahertz traffic that you are not aware of from the analysis LTE. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Wireless LAN Professionals Podcast. The podcast for wireless LAN professionals by wireless LAN professionals. Be sure to follow us on Twitter at Wireless LAN Pros for all the latest news and updates. And also connect directly with Keith on Twitter at Keith R. Parsons. Head over to www.wlandpros.com for this episode's show notes, as well as the latest in all things Wi-Fi. <laughs>